Welcome to the podcast. Super, super excited to jumpstart this podcast, Poets, Prophets, and Pioneers. I'm Rebecca Friedlander. My heart with this podcast is to give you some great tools, help you to really navigate this life adventure of faith that we have with Jesus, and to really come around you as community with some of my favorite people who have helped me step forward in my walk with Jesus. So welcome. Super excited to have you guys. And go ahead and please let us know where you're watching from in the chat. We love to connect with you guys. You are part of this conversation. You're especially um, a part of, of the questions and the flow of this conversation. Uh, when you have something on your heart, we want to hear. So let us know where you're you're coming from, where you're watching from today, and uh, we'll have a bit more even Q&A later in the conversation because I am excited to bring you guys around the table here uh, today. So let us know where you're coming from, pop something in the chat, share it with a friend because we are going deep today. I have some really amazing guests for you. And these are people who've made a huge impact in my life personally. I want to introduce them, but I'm going to share with you guys a quick scripture beforehand. This is what is just burning in my heart today as I've been sitting with Jesus. So, uh, you know what? Let's go ahead and pray before we start. And yay, Robin, watching from DFW, Julian from the UK, welcome you guys. Keep popping where you're from in the chat. We want to give you a quick shout out. I want to go ahead and pray uh, as we start off this podcast. Jesus, we love you. We come because we want to hear from you today. And we know that you speak through your body. And so, God, will you just come? Will you come and set our hearts, capture our hearts afresh today as we lean in to know you more? In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And Ralph from New Zealand, welcome. Joshua, Arizona, and watching from Denmark. Yes, just keep posting. Oh, Claudia, hello. Ron from the Dakotas. We're excited to have you guys all on board. I want to start with this scripture. I'm just going to take a quick minute because I don't want to take away from our amazing guests that we have, but I do want to preface it with this. This is Revelation chapter three, and it's the Lord speaking. And he says in verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame and sat with my father in his throne. We talk about this scripture often in the context of leading someone to Jesus. Jesus is standing at the door, knocking at your heart, open up to him, you know, let him in. But in context, and, and obviously that does work in the context of leading people to Jesus and salvation. But in the context, this scripture is given to the church and not just any church. It was a consumer driven church. And they had become so wrapped up in the things of the world that they had actually neglected their faith walk with Jesus. And Jesus was saying, I need you deeper right now. I need you to come deeper. I need you to overcome the lukewarm tendency in the world that you've become so attached to. And for those who overcome, I'm giving you the promise of authority. You're going to rule and reign with me. For those who, uh, well, let me just say it this way, intimacy with the Lord is required before we step into the place of authority. And this is, I so believe the Lord is speaking to us to just say, come deeper, come deeper. I'm standing at the door knocking and inviting you into this feast place um, in your life where you can wine and dine with the king, right? So, so good. And ah, the people that um, I'm going to bring on today are absolutely amazing. They're mentors, they're mentors, they're friends of mine. We've walked together for gosh, probably almost 10 years now, right around there. Um, but they're also international speakers and Bible teachers. I want to just read um, their bio for you guys. Bill and Pam Farrell are international speakers and relationship specialists. Ah! dedicated themselves to building up marriage and families. They co-founded LoveWise, an organization that connects love to wisdom to provide practical insights for personal relationships. 
they have seven grandkids and have written 61 books. So amazing. Will you guys welcome Bill and Pam Farrell? So excited. Hey, thank you so to be here with you, Rebecca. For those of you who don't know, Rebecca's like a daughter to us. She's like amazing. So good. Yeah, it is it is good to be with you, Rebecca, and we're proud of you getting the word out. That's right. Oh, well, I, I love you guys. As you know, I quote you all the time here at Potter's house and in my ministry. And what I love is that God has aligned us in certain very um, transition moments in my life. And you guys have spoken into me. I, I love to say that Pam is like the cheerleader. She's like, get out of the boat and walk in faith with Jesus. And Bill will tell you what to do when you get out of the boat. <laughs> That's <laughs> like, good. They will help you have the wisdom and the skills to manage. Whoa, okay, we're on the water now. How do we do this? What does this look like? And so Love Wise is an incredible uh, ministry. I'm going to just pop this up on the screen because this is one of their books that boomed all over the world. So if you've ever heard Men Are Like Waffles, Women Are Like Spaghetti, huge bestseller, um, they are the authors of that content. So we have the privilege of just sitting at their feet and listening today. So I, I just want to give you guys a minute if, if y'all want to jump in, because I've been talking a lot. <laughs> uh, but I, I would love to hear from you guys. What do you feel like is your heartbeat and passion? Because let me just say this really quick, because I'm single and yet I'm bringing you guys on because you are relationship coaches. And I think relationships are all about people you care about. It's not necessarily just marriage and family. It is literally the people in your life that you love the most and managing those places get that get a little bit sticky. And so when Jesus says, I want you to come deeper with me, it's not just those vertical places with you and Jesus, but it's also relationship with the people that you love. So yeah. what you guys say is your, your heartbeat. Like what is your, your passion, your vision? What makes you guys come alive with, within that context? Well, I think that you kind of alluded to it a minute ago. That, I mean, and we have, um, some books, Seven Simple Skills for Men and Women. And one of the quotes in there is, when your vertical relationship with God is strong, your horizontal relationships with others get stronger. And so it does really spring out of that relationship with God. And our ministry is love wise. And we like to say we park ourselves on the corner of God's love and God's wisdom. And we have um, a theme verse that also is the name of our nonprofit. And it's that is Proverbs 19.8. Which says the one who gets wisdom loves life. And everybody wants to love life, right? But God's wisdom is the way to get it. And so I think that um, when you look back at Bill and I, God brought us together very young um, at a very dysfunctional homes, like crazy. Um, I'm the firstborn daughter of an alcoholic dad with severe rage issues. Um, I always thought our family would make the headlines, but not for a good reason. More like man shoots family than shoots himself. A lot of domestic violence in the home that I grew up in. But my mom's best friend, she saw the chaos and craziness that we were living in. And she invited my mom to come to church and bring the kids often. So she did. And um, um, so there, um, my mom was 27 and I was seven. Uh, when we both came to Christ the same year. So we kind of grew up together. And that started a new legacy in our family tree. My mom had um, pulled away from some false teaching in a cult, actually, to bring us into Christianity. And um, she learned so much about Jesus um, because she was the craft lady for Vacation Bible School. So, I mean, God brought us both with that heart of a child. And I think that, you know, I have one of the poems in Abba's Heart, your book, you know, that is so beautiful and speaks from the Father's heart. And that is a lot of what God just wants us to have is that open heart of the child. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, he comes from similar crazy, right? <laughs> right, I like I, I grew up in a home where my mom was the dominant personality in my home growing up, but my mom was a very fearful, controlling individual. And I've since learned my mom grew up in a really dysfunctional place. Like her the home she grew up in was crazy. 
Yeah, both people were drinkers, mom and dad in that house. Right. And and my mom's attempt to overcome that was to just take control. And I think she had a sincere desire to make her life better than her mom's. But when you try to control everything, it only goes so far yeah. and it gets exhausting. And I was the youngest in my family. So I, I got a lot of my mom's exhaustion. And my mom would go through three very distinct phases over and over again. She she would go in lecture mode. And if you grew up in my house, you'd get called into the living room and she'd sit you down and lecture at you for two years at, or two hours at a time. <laughs> it felt, felt like two years. <laughs> <laughs> but that never got the results that she wanted. So then she would get angry. And in her anger, she would act out. She would often throw things. At times, she would she would hit the people that she loved. And then she would feel bad about it. She'd get depressed and she'd disappear for a couple of weeks. Like Bill started grocery shopping for himself at second grade and cooking for himself at second grade, doing laundry. I mean, so like when we... Um, when we got married, you know, me a good husband, even though it was painful to learn. It does. It does. A lot of times, you know, <laughs> wives will say my husband, he just keeps saying, oh, my mom doesn't do it that way. My mom doesn't do it this way. Oh, my mom cooks this. Yeah, my bar was pretty it low. It was so low. You could step on it. It was on the ground. So I was like amazing wife, you know, yeah. from day one. <laughs> yeah, but, but when we first got married, I required that when we had conflict with each other, we would hold hands. Because I knew if we were holding hands, she couldn't throw anything. And Bill's mom was a thrower. Bill likes to say a plate is worth a thousand words. Um, that's the kind of house he grew up in. So, oh my, goodness. so my response to growing up in that house is I just shut down. But I, I was emotionally numb. And, and that carried out into high school. But then at the end of my sophomore year in high school, I went to see an evangelistic film called The Exorcist. And it... Uh, it scared me into reading the Bible because what I had heard was this is based on something true. Like I knew Hollywood had overblown stuff, but I left that movie thinking if anything that I just saw was true, I'm kind of in trouble because I don't see any difference between me and that girl on the screen. Hmm. And so that motivated me to start reading the Bible. And after a month of reading the Bible pretty consistently, um, I came across first John four, four greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And it, the light went on. And I realized if I can get Jesus into my life, I'm going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And my brother had given his heart to Christ a couple of months before. So he was able to lead me in, in a, a prayer to get the relationship started. And what I realized almost immediately is that this Jesus we talk about is real, mm -hmm. He's a real person, he, he's actually alive. And when you enter a relationship with him, it, it has the ability to transform your life. Yeah. And it's, it's more than being involved in a church. It's more than being involved in uh, religious activity. It, I, I met a real Jesus. Yeah. And he came into my life and he started like the, the very first thing that happened was for 30 days after I saw the movie, I wasn't sleeping well. I was getting up five or six times a night scared and I would read the Bible a little bit more. And I was actually holding onto the Bible while I was sleeping because I'd seen vampire movies. And, you know, if you put up a cross, they can't get to you. And I thought maybe, maybe the Bible works the same way. It is a shield. <laughs> and the night that I prayed to receive Christ, I slept all night and I woke up the next morning. I went, well, something happened. And that began my journey of trying to figure out what just happened in my life. And what I've discovered over the years is that the core of Christianity is a relationship. Yeah. John 17, 3, it's the only place I know of in the Bible where eternal life is defined. Mm. It's defined as a relationship. Come on. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Yeah, yeah. So eternal life is not a destination. And it's not a length of time. It's a relationship. And because we're created in God's image, relationships are important to us because they're important to him. And then our influence as a body of Christ, it was defined by Jesus as, by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Okay, so I'm going to jump in right there because there are so many like little things that you guys are saying that <laughs> you unpack because it's so good. 
what I love about your stories is that you, like me, came from a home where there were a lot of good intentions and there was a lot of good stuff, but there was also some trauma and drama. Yeah, yeah. And here you guys are. Now you're speaking on the focus on the family. You're traveling international. Bill, you speak at Promise Keepers. Pam, you have this incredible women's ministry. You speak to couples all the time. And, and life didn't come easy or perfect for either one of you. I remember there was a moment where you guys helped me through a traumatic situation. And it was at a juncture. I feel like I remember something y'all told me a long time ago is that when you're moving into a place of transition or to a new season, you need new skills and new tools in that season. And I thought that was so good because that will either challenge you and make you feel in, you know, insecure because you're like, oh, I don't have what I need. Or it'll be like, oh, all I need to do is get some more skills and get some more tools. Great. I've got it. Let's do this. Mm -hmm. I remember there was a moment when I was struggling with something with my dad. And, and I mean, you guys have seen me in some of my messy moments dealing with things with both of my parents as an adult. Mm -hmm. And this was one of those messy cry moments um, where my dad was still alive. As, as many of you know, I had this incredible restoration story. The reason that I have this cabin is because God restored my relationship with my dad. Amen. But we were at this season several years before he passed where I knew that he was going to need more help in his season of, oh, just, just some of the things that come as you're, you're getting older and he still had traumatic brain injury and all of these things. And he would only allow me to help him to a certain point. And it just broke my heart. And I remember sitting with you guys at a church that I was attending. You happened to be driving through Little East Texas. And I happened to be here. And we met up in this church. And it was one of those messy cry moments where I was like, I want to help my dad. I want to respect my father. I believe God has a call on the ministry for this family line. But I can't, I can only help him so much. What do I do? And you guys came responded back with something so profound that deeply touched me in that season and enabled me to handle that fractured piece of life. I don't know if you remember it, so I will just jog your memory. Yes, please. <laughs> but I remember, Bill, you said something about um, you can look at your family line, your family heritage, see what God's calling is on your family and follow God's calling on your family. You can honor your family by honor God's calling on your family line. Even if your family doesn't quite get it yet. Don't remember that. I'm sure you said it to right. multiple people. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Just Bill often says, you know, honor your father and mother doesn't mean do exactly what they say, especially if they're toxic, dysfunctional, and not walking with Jesus. And, um, moreover, he says, um, what it really means is take your family line to the place that God originally decided and destined it to go. You know, God's plan for your family. I'll let Bill explain more of it. Well, we, yeah, there's a definite shift in the Bible. When you're young, children are told to obey their parents. And then it shifts to later on in life, you want to honor or respect your parents. Mm. And you know, we get all confused on what it means to respect our parents. We, right. we tend to think, oh, that's an adult version of obeying them. And we tend to get caught up in this. Well, we, we can't disagree with our parents. We can't be difficult with our parents. But that's not what honor means. Right. Like we know that your influence, everybody that's listening right here, your influence automatically goes three or four generations deep. It's how God designed people. You know, and we're all we're all aware of the scary part of that. In Exodus 20, we read, you know, the sins of the fathers get visited to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. We're all like, oh, no, my bad things are going to pass but, on. But then we don't keep reading because the very next statement says, but his loving kindness is spread to thousands of those who love me. Wow. And in Hebrew, it's a parallel passage. And what God's trying to tell us is our our influence goes three and four generations deep which means God's been working in our life long before we ever showed up. And God has a plan for us as individuals, but he also has a plan for our families. And when God gets a hold of your life and you decide to do a course correction, I'm going to get the family system back on track. 
God looks at you and says, that's a person honoring their parents. And God then works around you. And in my family, like I, I found out later in life that in my family, for four generations that we know of, when people get married, they break their relationship with their parents. So I never knew for my like dad's family. Crazy, ridiculous reasons. Didn't spend time with my mom's family from four on. I was kind of shocked that my mom didn't come to our wedding. But then I found out her mom didn't go to her wedding. Mm -hmm. And this has been going on for a while. And so we decided, you know, we're going to do things different. And there was a time when, when my, we had two kids at the time. They were like four and two. There was an experience that happened with my parents that tempted us to break our relationship with them. Mom had been outrageous and angry and et cetera. And the only thing that stopped me was I want to be able to tell my kids that family is important. So I have to find out a way to, to have a relationship with my parents. Mm -hmm. So we figured it out. We had a very limited relationship with my parents, but we maintained the relationship. When the kids were little, we had like a two hour rule because that's about like 90 minutes to two hours is about how much mom could handle before she would erupt. And so if we could sense her escalating, um, Bill had uh, trained the boys when I stand up and say, time to go. It means time to go. Start moving. Get to the car. And that way it rescued before the eruption happened. And um, but we were able to build a bridge um, mm -hmm. to between generations with uh, the health that Jesus gave us and the strength that Jesus gave us. We could reach back uh, to Bill's folks. And even more, moreover, when I was pregnant with Brock, um, we were going to be up near her, uh, mom's parents. And I said, do you want to stop and see them? Uh, you know, the family, the siblings and and grandma and he hadn't seen them for like decades and so we were wise enough to call and say would that be okay mom and dad if we did this and they're like sure well out of that visit not only do we get reconnected to a big part of the family tree but we reconnected mom with her mom and they had a little moment of meeting that had been fractured mm -hmm. for like decades and decades. And so we can be the bridge builders. And oftentimes, um, you know, we, we can even look back on our family heritage and kind of see where God might be taking our next generations of family tree. For example, um, there's somebody from New Zealand on with us right now. Well, my family immigrated from New Zealand and um, they were shepherds. And um, when, but when they landed in the States, they got involved with, uh, they wanted to find the quote promised land uh, of Joseph Smith and, you know, Moroni, Angel Moroni and the Mormon church. And so cult. And um, so th that's the, what happened is that um, that immigrant from New Zealand married a bishop's daughter and that began the my great grandfather then my grandfather but then my mom came to jesus and she brought our family into christianity and then reached back and her parents both received christ too before they entered heaven and moreover when i started studying celtic christianity under you rebecca then i got really curious and we took a dna test and we found out that we're like way celtic that i knew i was you know scottish and had mcmillan and bill had Mc, mcbean but we found out we're super irish too and that so as the more i learned about the um, celtic christianity i started conversing with my mom and she's like oh well, you know, great grandma gave me this book and it has like our family history in it. I found out that our family in Ireland were believers. And wow. then they went to New Zealand to share Jesus. And so all along, God wanted us to be believers. And so we had to follow Jesus to help graft our future generations into Christianity. Mm -hmm. And um, now this summer, our um, two oldest granddaughters are, are going on a big mission trip overseas, you know, sharing Jesus. Uh, and so it's fun and productive 
to both look forward, where does God want to take this family, but also look back. What is the history and foundation that we want to build on that's healthy? Sometimes it's only a little sprig that's healthy that you can build on, but find the healthy and then build on that. Yeah, that's so good. And there's there's two moments of, of what you said that I would love to unpack a little bit. The first one is just the idea of looking back into your, your heritage. You know, we talk a lot here about generational curses and overcoming and breaking off yeah. things that are the um, the negative things, you know, part of what's passed down just like Adam and Eve to their uh, descendants, but also the generational blessing. I can look back in my family line and my great grandmother was an author, you know, uh, wrote best-selling books in her time during the depression. My, um, my grandmother was an incredible uh, creative and, um, you know, just all of these innovative, creative, entrepreneur, uh, like-minded, that, that kind of stream, that vein, it runs through my family, even if they didn't all know Jesus, even if they weren't all following him or honoring him with their gifts, how much more can we accomplish for the kingdom when we actually go, oh, Okay, I'm going to look back my roots, not because I feel like those will box me in, but they can help give me um, the the permission to fly and what God exactly. has given me to do. And, it's like a trampoline. Me. Like I was a gymnast. And when you jump on the trampoline, you soar. And that is what our heritage is. It's like the, the launching pad, the diving board, that trampoline to help you soar into the future that God wants for you. Yeah, yeah, that's so good. Mike put up the scriptures from Hebrews about being surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. You know, there are moments, even what I'm doing with here at the cabin, because this was so rich in history with my parents' vision and what was on their heart to pursue. And all of a sudden here I'm in the middle of finding myself doing some of those same things. I literally feel surrounded by the cloud of witnesses, even though my parents are not here anymore. It's just this sense of, of destiny that just sort of happens when you follow Jesus. You know, sometimes it happens without even trying, doesn't it? Exactly. Exactly. Because the Holy Spirit is so powerful. Like the Holy Spirit can break any generational, you know, curses that it can break any of our own bad habits that we, you know, and poor choices that we made. If we just surrender our life to Jesus with an open hand and say, here's my heart. And we have that contrite spirit that the Psalms talk about, which means broken into teeny tiny pieces so that there's just the remnant, like the dust that God created us from. And he picks up that contrite heart and he recreates us into that new creature and sends us, you know, where he wants us to go. Yeah. yeah you know, Rebecca, you mentioned about heritage and I was really aware of the bad stuff. In, in my family line uh, until later in life, my dad started talking. Like my dad was the silent partner for eight decades. <laughs> like he just, he didn't talk about stuff. He didn't bring up stuff that mattered, but in his eighties, he started talking. He was a gr he was a brilliant scientist though. Yeah. And he made a very good income and he gave Bill really great DNA. He's a smart guy over here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And so my dad started doing research on our family and I found out that there's three really positive things in our, my background. One is that I have, I have courageous relatives. So some of my relatives fought with William Wallace in Scotland and, and then they had to leave Scotland. They went down to England and a lot of them crossed over on the Mayflower. So they helped, you know, settle the first colonies here in the States. And so there's this courageous line. And I've always thought it was interesting. One of the things I appreciate most about Pam is she's one of the most courageous ladies I've ever met. And that's always been a really precious thing to me. And now I look back and go, well, it's been part of our family. He was attracted to it. Yeah. The second thing is there's there's inventors in my background. Like the the pump up garden sprayer that everybody uses, the spray weeds. I, a relative of mine invented that as well as some other things. And so there's this innovative line that runs through my background. And the, but the funny part is if you don't like treasure the positives and you let the negative take over. So these people created this amazing pump sprayer thing that made them millions of dollars, two brothers, the brothers had a fight and one brother won the money and the other brother 
lost out. We're on the other brother's side. Yeah. And so, but if the family would have stayed tight and had that healthy relationship, everybody would have prospered. It would have been like that Psalms one tree, you know, with the fruit that just hangs to the ground. There's so much fruit. And so that's why it's important to know both. Like, what are the gifts that God has given to you, given to your family? What are we stewards of? What are those talents? And then also, what are those, you know, got to watch out for this stuff. Um, for example, my son, um, my oldest son, our oldest son went to a prayer conference once he was married and a dad. And um, he said in the prayer conference, we had to draw our family tree as far back as we knew it. And then we had to write down the sins that so easily beset us. So any sins that you knew were in that family tree. And then, um, you were supposed to confess any that you had fallen for any of those traps um but any that were um that your parents or grandparents that you knew they dealt with they surrendered and they took from darkness to light then color those in highlighter he said our family tree like lit up like a christmas tree when i realized how much hard work you and dad did to move from unhealthy to healthy through the power of Jesus. And that's really the key. And, and that's why I I'm so excited about your Taking the Gate book, Rebecca, and uh, our books, the Simple Skills books that we have, and the Bible studies, the Creative Bible studies, um, because it helps people do that. It helps people see the good, but also like move from darkness to light. You don't have to stay stuck. Yeah, absolutely. And and let me just hop in and say, we are hoping to get these two out for a retreat here at the cabin. So if you love what they're sharing, if you love on their heart, stay posted on that. It'll either be hopefully this fall, but if not sometime soon, because we would love to to just really, um, yeah, have them pour even more to you, into you guys. So, so let's transition a bit and talk about the nitty gritty of the how-to and the application, because Pam, you're alluding, alluding to it. Generational Curses, my book, Taking the Gate, helps people to know how to do that. In my story, it even started before those moments because I knew that forgiveness was something Jesus was really passionate about. And, and today I teach that forgiveness and inner healing are often, they walk hand in hand, but sometimes they take both of your hands. It's, it's two different things that we have to steward. Forgiveness is a choice. Inner healing is a process. Nice. And I remember I had some mentors in my early 20s who really coached me in forgiveness toward my parents, but also the inner healing. And they poured so much into me that I started to get strong in some of those wounded places and began to really take back some emotional strength. Uh, my heart was good, but I was still pretty wounded. And after about a year of them, nine months to a year of them really pouring into me, I was working on my very first music CD. And one of my mentors said, I think you need to send a copy to your dad. Now, my dad had been arrested for child abuse after a car accident where he had received a uh, traumatic brain injury. Like he was terrible with <laughs> verbal abuse and just all just just not a healthy safe person but my mentor was picking something up and whether it was something i just needed to do or whether they had a sense where mm, i think maybe there's some reconciliation or restoration possible here wow. they they nudged me to do it and i was like no you don't know my dad that's not a good idea but i went to prayer and i thought you know i would feel bad if something happened to my dad and i didn't try to reach out yep so I sent him my first music CD. We started corresponding. His heart was open. I still remember the day I went to visit him in Wisconsin. I was living in Texas. He was in this little tiny country cottage in this tiny little town. The place was, <laughs> I won't go into that right now, but <laughs> I, remember, <laughs> I remember meeting him in this little cafe and we walked in and I sat across this booth from my dad. My brother was with me. And it was like talking to a whole nother person. Because over those eight years of not having any contact with my dad, God had done a work in his heart and he was tender and sweet and in love with Jesus. Wow. And I remember walking out of that place and my brother said, I think that's the biggest miracle I've ever seen God do. 
Nice. Softened the heart of my dad. And over the next two years, we built relationship until finally I moved him down here and we found this cabin for him to live in. And the rest is ended up leaving me this place. And so I think, but the moment I want to get to, and I just want to highlight this and then turn it back to you guys. I remember sitting in a hotel room with my brothers and my dad. This was again about a year and a half or so after we had really reconnected and just trying to gauge, you know, how healthy is this relationship going to be, to be super honest, right? You know, can we actually build relationship? Is there going to be enough give and take in a healthy way? And um, I remember my dad, he just said, he sat us all down and he said, I want to ask you guys to forgive me. I have sinned against God and you guys, and I, I, I repent and I ask your forgiveness. And, and at that moment, because I had had some mentoring and I had done gone deep, you know, and worked things out with between me and God, I was able to say to my dad, Dad, I already have forgiven you. Yes. Not because it sounded good, but because I really meant it. And I had gone down deep. And and from that moment, we were able to to really rebuild and start fresh. Exactly. So, I mean, can we can we talk about, you know, what are what are some things that we can pinpoint? You know, obviously there's some relationships that are not going to have that that two way um, ability to navigate that chaos and that messiness, because you've got to have both people do the hard work. But what are some ways that we personally can help get there so we can recognize one of those treasures when it shows up? Um, yeah. What are some I'll of the ways on my side and then Bill teaches on forgiveness? On my side, you know, God, almost from the beginning, he wanted to teach me about him as my father in heaven. Because I have so wounded by my earthly dad, I could not have a relationship with my earthly dad unless my vertical relationship with God was strong. So as a young college student at 19, I decided I'm going to learn about Abba Father. And so from Genesis to Revelation, I read the Bible underlining anything that connected me to God as my father. And man, I hung out in the Psalms for a good long time. And, you know, that prepared my heart for then being able to reach out to my dad. And um, by then my parents had divorced. I was the only one brave enough to go spend time with my dad because I knew Jesus was with me. And I could I could view my dad not as this big monster, but instead he was a broken man. And he was shattered because he had never felt love um, at growing up in the home that he grew up uh, of an alcoholic dad. So God prepared my heart by giving me compassion and then clarity, compassion, listen to your dad. What's going on really here? Compassion, listen to me, Pam, and I can give you compassion. Clarity, you're going to need some boundaries. Don't get in the car when he's been drinking, you know, so, you know, lay out some good boundaries. Um, but that all prepared me for the day that I was going to then extend forgiveness and reconciliation to my dad. And I'll let Bill share the steps of forgiveness um, and then we'll share kind of how God wrapped uh, mine up in a bow. Well, I, I appreciate you bringing this up, Rebecca, because I, I think this is one of the topics that we're all supposed to be masters of. Yeah. Because our faith is all about forgiveness. Come on. Like Jesus could have come to the earth to make us better, to make us more successful, to make all of us wealthy, to make us subservient to him. But he came to this earth so that he could die on the cross to forgive us because he knew it was our biggest need. And so it doesn't surprise me that there's a lot of confusion about forgiveness in people's minds because it's one of the cores of our spiritual battle. And Colossians 3.13 challenges every one of us to be masters of forgiveness. It says, bear with one another. And forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And I know for me, first time I saw that verse, it was stunning to me. Because as I understand that verse, it says we're supposed to forgive everybody for everything. And at the time, I had a list of people in my life that I didn't think deserved to be forgiven. So it kind of threw me into a crisis. I'm like, Lord, I got to figure out how to do this. Because if I'm supposed to do this, I don't know how right now. And I went searching for the how. And 
honestly had trouble finding the how. I, like lots of people were talking about how important it was. A lot of people were talking about what happens in your life if you don't forgive. You know, it shows up in your attitude. It shows up in your body. It shows up in your relationships. But I, I, I couldn't find the handles. Like, how do I walk through this? So he was a pastor at the time. So our church was filled with people that are broken and hurting, you know? So we really, it wasn't just for us. It was for like them that Bill was on this pursuit of how can I make forgiveness broken down into bite-sized pieces so people can really get their heart and their hands around it and their soul around it. So I looked at the gospel and I said, if we apply this to interpersonal relationships, what would it look like? (laughs) And it turned into six statements that form a working definition of forgiveness. And if, if people want it, we can send it to them. But it, in a nutshell, it's I forgive and you name the person for and you specifically name what you're forgiving them for. And second is I, I understand that what they did was wrong. It wasn't just unfortunate. It wasn't just different. What they did was wrong because mm-hmm. we have to be able to say it's wrong before we can forgive it. Come on. If it's not wrong, then we're just talking preferences we have to courageously say this is wrong, just like Jesus did with us in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So the gospel contains this reality that we were wrong and needed a savior. The third is I do not expect this person to make up for what he or she has done because it's impossible. They can't make up for it. The damage has already been done. They, there can be a reset point, but they can't make up for what they've done. But I'm not going to define this person by what they've done because we have a habit of defining people as monsters in our life. You know, this is a person that ruined my life. This is a person that made everything difficult. This is a person that made things impossible to me. And while we do that, we're just handing over emotional control to them. So we have to decide we're going to decide to find people the way God defines people. And that is we're all in desperate need of God's grace. If you don't know Jesus as your savior, you desperately need his grace for eternal life. And if you know Jesus as your Savior, you desperately need his grace for everyday living. And anybody who gets away from the grace of God does ugly things. And when we define everybody that way, we're all the same size. And you can forgive people who are the same size as you. The fifth statement is, I will not manipulate this person with the offense. Because if you have to manipulate, they have control. A lot of times they say, yeah, let's bury the hatchet. Then we keep a roadmap to where the hatchet's been buried. Yeah. And. And then what I think is the most important statement is I will not allow what's happened to stop my personal growth. Come on. It's based on 2 Peter 3.18. It says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And bitterness stunts people's growth. So you haven't really forgiven until you've recommitted to your own personal growth and become the person God's capable of making you in this world. Like it's you saying, yes, bad things happen to good people. Yep. Sometimes life is unfair, but you know what? I'm going to own my side of the issue and I'm going to hold on to God's hand and whatever you say, I will do. And wherever you lead, I will go. And it's like you saying enough is enough. In my generation, I'm going to break free so that my family, my future, my future kids and their generations can live free. So it's a powerful freeing statement. Like a lot of times people think forgiveness is like being a doormat. Oh, no, it's like the opposite. Forgiveness is like being a warrior for your family and for your future. Yeah. It's really important. I I need to say this, Rebecca. I'm going to feel like I didn't finish. It's really, (laughs) really important. That we separate out forgiveness from working on relationships. Reconciliation. Because forgiveness is all about protecting your heart and making sure there is no bitterness in your soul. Because none of us have room for bitterness. None of us can afford it. None of us have enough space for it. And if bitterness gets a hold of you, it will eat away until it gets your whole life. But putting relationships together, it requires both people to operate. That's why in in Romans 12, 18... It says the the following, if possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Come on. And our greatest example, I believe, is Joseph. Joseph has this reunion with his brothers in Genesis 45. He's been severely wronged by his brothers, but in his heart, he has forgiven them. He's committed to personal growth. He's become the second most powerful man in the most powerful nation on earth. 
and his brothers come and they need what he has to give them. Mm-hmm. And he says to them, verse 9, 10, and 11, guys, I'm ready to do this. I'm ready to move you. I'm ready to provide for you. All you have to do is go home and tell dad what happened. Own your issue. And he requires a step of repentance on their part in order to put the relationship back together. Mm. Now, he's already forgiven them, but he knows that in the reality of life, if they don't move, the relationship cannot be healthy at the level he would like to have it. Because they won't be healthy. Right. And so that's why, you know, you can tell a healthy person from a toxic person because healthy people always own their issues. (laughs) They always like, oh, what I did was wrong. Please forgive me. That is a healthy person. Yeah, they, they don't explain it. They don't give you all the reasons but, why but, they but, had to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> they just own it. Right. And, right. and I, I think sometimes, oh gosh, so much of what you're saying, we need to do like multiple podcasts now to unpack all this. <laughs> Come to the cabin. You know, it's interesting though, because forgiveness has been so highlighted, even in this last retreat that we just did. And it wasn't like our key topic or anything. But the idea of forgiveness just kept coming up. And, and I would add, one thing to your list bill that is just because there's not much you can add there's just it's so powerful already really taking your i I feel like when when you're speaking let me just say this what was coming to me is that forgiveness is a commitment to wholeness yes yes yeah your commitment to personal growth is part of overcoming toxic behavior and it also is part of your plumb line for forgiveness and so we can't, you know, and it's not like we can hold that over anyone's head. You know what I mean? Like, but at the same time, it's like, no, I've committed in humility to continue growing with my father and to yes. be everything he's yep. called me to be. So out of that place, I forgive. And what I tell people is that forgiveness is a spiritual practice. It is a spiritual discipline. It will require discipline of you because you won't feel like it all the time, but it's a way to look like Jesus really quick. Because Jesus forgave us. And all we're doing is extending grace to people who don't deserve it because Jesus did that for us. Mm -hmm. So when we're practicing out of that, but also for those of us who need a little reward out of the process, by Philemon, when Paul is encouraging forgiveness for a runaway slave, he says, as he's writing to the former slave owner, we can debate that all day long, but here's the... In the context of the cultural situation, he said, if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it. Albeit, I do not say to you that, I mean, you owe me your own soul anyway, because I led you to the Lord is basically what he was saying within the context of this conversation. But it was the idea of if this person owes you anything, I'm asking you to forgive them and then put the balance on my account. And what really helped me to own the forgiveness process and all the steps that you guys have shared was to then realize that I can take that offense. I can take what has been wronged or what has been robbed, and I can then turn to the father and put it on his account. Because people will not always repay you, right? Just like you guys were saying. Rarely. Yeah, rarely. Like one out of a thousand will actually turn around and repay you. Or, or restore, but the father loves to give us good gifts. And it's just one more connection point with the father when we can shift our expectation off of the people who have wronged us and place it on the father. Because if Paul was saying this, how much more would the father in heaven say, I love to give you good gifts. I love to restore. I love to give to you when you turn to me. And he loves to turn that around, doesn't he? And provide and restore. He does. He does. And you know, the the whole set of forgiveness and all we've taught here on forgiveness between what you've shared and um, what Bill shared. Um, when God laid that before me as a young mom and said, okay, Pam, ever since you received Jesus, those six statements, I've weaved them into your life. Step by step, I could look back and Jesus led me th- to those steps before Bill wrote them down because they're God's steps, right? And then, then he said, okay, you've forgiven your dad for, for everything you can think of. Um, so now bless those who curse you. Bless and curse not. So I want you to write a blessing to your dad. And I'm like, 
I can't even think of one good, happy thing to start the blessing on. Okay, Lord, I'll start with that. Give me the want to, to want to write a blessing and show me one happy memory. And he did that. He gave this beautiful memory and um, I wrote it up in a story. I framed it for my dad to give it to him at Christmas, but I had to give it open-handed, open-hearted. Like no matter how he responds, God has called me to give him this gift of a blessing. And um, so I called him into, so it's just him and I, not like in front of everybody. And I said, Daddy, I, I just want to bless you and thank you for what you've poured into my life. And I read the blessing to him and he started crying. And he's like, he called, my nickname was Charlie. He's like, Charlie girl, if you want to share you know, thank you for saying such nice things about this bad old good old boy. If you ever want to share our story to help other people, you can just do that, Charlie. Mm -hmm. And I, my first book was coming out and I, my story needed to be in it. And I was like, Lord, how can I do this and not cause more fracture in the family? And then God yeah. said, bless your dad. And I had no idea that my dad was going to bless me back by giving me freedom to share the healing that God had brought to our family. And my relationship with my dad was restored. And then it helped my brother, my sister, my mom, you know, his family. It just kind of spread um, because it was like a template or a format that people could follow bless with open hands and just give God a chance. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I have one mm -hmm. final question as we wrap up, you guys have been so amazing uh, to share with us and just pour into us. Um, what happens if, you know, we're talking about generational, we're talking about parents, about, you know, getting with the father. And I love to say getting with the father's DNA. We belong to the father first before we came here. You know, yeah. he, he wants us to sync back up with the, through the cross with him being our father to pull on Abba's heart. You know, this is resonating with you. Get a copy of the book, Abba's heart. Pam has written in it. I have written in it. It's all blessings from Abba father that can really plug you into the righteous understanding of what it means to have God as your father plug into that place. Let's get healed. And then let's extend that love when it hasn't been offered to us uh, from our parents in, in certain ways. But I, I would love for us to just touch on this as we're wrapping up. What do you do if your parent has passed away? If they're, if you're not able to reach out and you guys know my story, um, I was not able to reconnect and restore with my mom before she passed just within the last number of months. And, and I had a whole bunch of other emotions that I had to work up work through when I found out that she had passed, you know, how do you, what are some tips for dealing with a fractured relationship that, you know, there's no way to restore this side of heaven? Um, how do we practice forgiveness and really let the Lord come in and do his work in that kind of situation? Honestly, it's the same steps just given differently. So you walk through those statements of forgiveness and you write down every offense and then you go back and forgive every offense. You wrap it up and you give it to the father. You can do it in, in a way that's very tangible. Like you could, you know, put it through a paper shitter or, or put it in the fireplace and just like, Lord, out of these ashes make beauty. Yeah. And then you write the letter of blessing. Lord, I'm going to redeem the things that even if they're just a thread of something positive, I want you to show me the positives that I can pull out, the treasures that I can pull out. And then you write that letter of thanks. And this one could be like put in the cemetery or read over their headstone or just put in the family Bible. You know, um, it could be buried even like buried um, and Lord, you talk to him in heaven because I can't do that. You know? So trust the father's heart that he's going to communicate, you know, because there's no tears in heaven. So we know that somehow God works it all out on that side of glory. And, and I would just add to that, Rebecca, one of the most important steps we take as adults is the day that we honestly evaluate our parents. Like I, I believe it's the intent of the leave and cleave command. You know, we all leave, you know, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and two become one flesh. We tend to view that as a physical leaving. You know, we leave our parents' house, we establish ourselves as adults, and then we just interact as we need to. But when that passage was written, 
people worked with their parents every day. It was an agricultural society. You know, if Pam and I got married, we'd keep working with our parents every day, working the family business. So the leaving and cleaving, it's actually an evaluation. And you can do that with your parents, whether they're alive or they've passed. You, you can be thankful for what did my parents give me that's good. And and even, even really bad parents have a couple of things that they left that were good. You know, like, like I wouldn't give my parents real high marks as strategic parents, but they both worked really hard. And that was a really valuable thing that they passed on. Now, my mom works really weird. Like the stuff she works on is weird. But she works hard at but it. But she works really hard at it. And then my parents have a really simple sense of morality. If it's right, you do it. If it's not, you don't. And they weren't always perfect at keeping it, but they had that simple sense. And that's, that's helpful. But then there were a lot of other things that they were just deficient at. Mm -hmm. And as an adult, if I say, hey, mom, dad, thank you for all these things, which I think the easiest way to express it is in a letter that you never sent. Right. You know, thank you for these heritage things that you gave me. And then you write down the areas that they aren't, weren't good at and you release them. And you say, you know, mom, I know you weren't very good at this. You weren't very good. So I'm releasing you and I'm taking those areas over. And asking God to then move the family in that positive direction. And that process of honestly evaluating, it's not all good. It's not all bad because all of our parents are human, broken to a certain level. And I, we even told our kids when they left the house, hey, guys, you need to evaluate us as parents. Hopefully you'll give us credit for the things we did well. And then I want you to identify the things we didn't do well and take those areas over. And if you can't think of anything we did poorly, I'll start the list for you because <laughs> I'm aware of some stuff that we could have done better because I wanted them to have the freedom to say, I've evaluated my parents and now I have ownership of my growth. So me and Jesus can now work on it. And a lot of people are trying to take their stuff to Jesus. And Jesus is saying, your parents still have control of that. So go release your parents and then bring it back to me. And then we'll go to work. And sometimes you need to have something tangible. For example, okay, my dad had like a lot of things that were super toxic, but I had forgiven him and I blessed him. But when he passed away, I like needed a way to grieve this mixed bag, you know, right. of like the dad that I always wished that I had and then the dad that I did have. And so... um he loved country music. So then I, I bought Christian country music to listen to and my grief process. And my dad was a beautiful gardener. He had beautiful roses. Mm -hmm. So I planted a rose garden in the front of our house in honor of my dad. So beauty from ashes. And so think about a tangible mm -hmm. way, a, something you can create something that you can put, you know, painting on your wall, a uh, special scripture verse, you know, the more tangible and the more often you see it, the more you're going to be reminded that God is the great redeemer. I know my redeemer lives. Yeah. 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 And often we are specifically saying, God, I'm going to speak beauty over this, even though my emotions are speaking so loudly otherwise in the moment. Amen. So like when my mom passed away last year, I want to go get 500 daffodil bulbs. Okay. I'm extreme, but yes. I and plan, plan them around the space where I'm believing God for prayer cabins because I want the hope that comes to life in the spring when I put something kind of ugly and kind of weird in the soil, but I believe in the hope of resurrection. And I believe that my mom knew Jesus and I believe that my dad knew Jesus and they're in heaven today. And God is able to sort out all of this messy stuff that I was not able to see happen here on earth, but he is a whole lot bigger than I am. Oh, your daffodils must be blooming wonderfully right now. Yes, they are. <laughs> but I also, I make that statement that I just made partially after talking with you guys. So I will give you credit for that piece <laughs> The growth and the conclusion that I have come to in my life. What a blessing to have you guys on. I would love for you guys to pray for us, but I want to say this too. 
I believe that we've really received some meat from the word, word today. You guys have not just stayed surface. You guys have gone deep and given us a lot of practical stuff. So I want to do something I was not planning to do. I want to give people an opportunity to sow back into you. And we're going to sow into the ministry, um, your ministry as well. Um, but even if you guys are just like, wow, that really blessed me, I want to give them a coffee date. I want to give them a cup of coffee. I'm going to sew like $10 into the ministry and today it's going to go toward them. And so if you want to do that, go to RebeccaFreelander.com, hit the donate button. And um, we're, we're just going to do that because we just love these guys and we want them to come to the cabin. So yes, come yes. on, you guys. Awesome <laughs> if it funded our airplane flights to the cabin. That'd be great. I know. Yeah. Maybe you guys are just like, hey, we want to fund their airplane fight flights to come to the cabin so they can do a retreat and um and come out and, and speak into more, us more so go to rebecca if you want to give generously please do if you want to go hey we want to give them a coffee date whatever comes in if you want to drop a note with it and we're going to sew into them too so okay. do you guys just pray for us um we value you guys i value you i value your time and your coaching and what you've spoken into us today would you just go ahead and pray for those who are listening Lord, thank you so much for this time. Thank you that you are the one who forgave us. You're our Abba Father. And I love how Rebecca says our DNA is in you first. And so today, Lord, we pray that each person takes home a personal post-it note from heaven to their heart. And Father, we thank you for creating a system where not only are we forgiven, but you figured out a way to live in our lives. So we literally have spiritual, supernatural resources available to us. So I mm -hmm. want to commit everybody who's listening right now to your grace. And I pray that this week you would do through them what is beyond them for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. I'll just add to that, Father God, I pray that we would not miss one ounce of what you want to heal and what you want to release through us uh, with your souls for forgiveness and god every bit of the treasures and the things you want to redeem in each person who will be listening to this now or later that father that we would be courageous we would take the the um every ounce of faith that we have and go after this place because god i just believe it's a way we can honor you we can practically follow Jesus and we can watch him show up in our lives. And Lord, for anyone who just is so wounded, they're like, I don't even know how to start this mm -hmm. because I just feel so stuck in this place. Father, I, will you just come close? And yes. will you just wrap your arms and, and come and bring us under the shadow of your wings and just cause us to receive such a fresh touch of the Father's love that empowers us to do things we never thought we were capable of just because you're so good. We honor you. We praise you, Father. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Bless you, beautiful daughter in the Lord. Uh, I love you guys. I'm telling you, I'm just going to say one more thing to brag on these guys. Y'all, I would not be where I am without these two. And I'm telling you, part of God's forgiveness rewards is that when you put things down his account, he brings them back around. I have fathers and mothers in my life that have helped me to get to where God is calling me to be. Not because I had the perfect parents, but because God said, well, okay, you're working on the hard part of forgiveness. Now I'm going to bring people alongside of your journey who have the capability as spiritual fathers and mothers to speak mm -hmm. destiny over you. So you will be able to fly and do everything I've called you to do. So I just want to encourage you guys, embrace the process process of forgiveness. Watch for those people God is bringing alongside of you and let's follow Jesus together. Amen. Amen. Love you all. Thanks so much for being online. Guys, go ahead and um, check out. Uh, yeah, we're doing this every single Wednesday at noon. So come back, come back, tell a friend and we will see you next week. Blessings.